Um, so like I said, my name is Rachel. Um, I'm going to be talking today about more abstract modeling. So modeling things like the concept of beauty. So real quick, I'm Rachel Ferguson, and I want you to be excited about creating models yourselves that predict weird things that no one has really thought of doing before. So starting off, we have a couple goals here. Um, so there's been a couple machine learning talks so far, so I'm gonna go really quickly through the basics of machine learning, because I'm sure you've all heard it a million times at this point. And then we're gonna dig into CNNs, which are convolutional neural networks. And these are a model that is optimized for processing images. Then we're gonna get into our beauty classification model. Now this part I made a few twinges to instead of the abstract, so cut down a little bit for time, and then also more of a focus on uh, most important aspects of modeling, at least going forward. So this part might be a little bit of deja vu if you were here for the last talk with Eva. <laughs> and then we're gonna go into potential applications. So how can we use these abstract models and how are they useful? So starting off, here are the general steps of your machine learning project. So these are the ones you walk through anytime you wanna create a project. You're gonna get your data, choose a model. Data. You're gonna fit your model and test it. If it's great, cool. If it doesn't, retune it, clean your data again, 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 again. Again, just more of a basic overview. But going forward, these are the two that I consider to be the absolute most important. These are the ones you spend the most time on. These are the ones that are least likely to be completely automated out within five years. So we're gonna really focus on getting data and cleaning data which goes along with our mentality going through this whole thing, which is garbage in, garbage out. I don't think I could repeat that enough, is that your data going in, if your data going in is baloney, your model's baloney, no matter how much you tune it. <laughs> so, now we're gonna talk about convolutional neural networks, which is what our model is going to be based on that we work through. So this is the nest of machine learning. You might be able to switch around neural networks and deep learning, depending on how useful you want your neural network to be. But overall, there's machine learning, and then you go down to neural networks, and then you go down to convolutional neural networks. So if you know where a neural network is, a convolutional neural network is very similar, but it has this pre-processing step where it's optimized for taking in images, adjusting them to pull out cool features, and then it makes a neural network off of those things. So it takes this abstract image and makes features that you can understand or a computer can understand. So this is an example of what that pre-processing could look like. So you have your input, which is a grainy image of somebody's face. We're gonna convert that all into the pixel representation of these colors, and that is the information that the computer can actually understand. And then we're going to filter it. So filtering, this is a lot. So if you don't capture all of it, again, this is like a 30 minute talk, I understand. But a filter is a small little square. So like this one is say six pixels by six pixels. And it kind of looks like that. What you're gonna do is you're gonna take this little image and you're gonna take the big image that you wanna predict on and you're gonna take this filter and go across the whole thing. So let's pretend we're looking at just this little six by six square in the end there, which can be representative right there. So we have that and then we have our filter. And if you multiply those two representations across, you get a huge number because they're very, very similar looking. Versus if we were looking at something like the mouse's ear, they don't look anything at all to each other, so we get a zero. And these filters are how you can pull out ideas of what an image looks like from it. So something like a low-level filter, which is what we saw before, where it's a line, it's real simple, you can pull out features like that. But then as you stack these filters on top of each other, all these lines start to make shapes together. And you can pull out things like eyeballs and then eyebrows. And then you can stack all those on top of each other. And you can pull out things like faces. So it's all this continual stacking to pull out these features that now your computer understands what it is even looking for. If it's looking for faces, it knows to look for these particular things in your image. So some kind of cool uses that we're currently using CNNs for. Face recognition. 
This one's a little polarizing as to how much people like it. But for security monitoring, you could have a camera set up and they'll check whoever's coming into your building and be like, do we know this person? Is it a visitor? And so on. It can easily detect who should not be in your building. Again, it's a little polarizing as to whether you prefer this way. But you can also do things like translating handwritten text into strings and ints. Um, this is one of the more basic or more original ones. If you're looking into any kind of CNNs, you're going to find a tutorial on how to do this a million times. So this was a really very useful thing. It's currently being used, say, if you have a checking account and you want to upload a check, you can just upload a picture and it can translate all that handwritten text into things that the computer understands. And then a little more out there one would be playing checkers. So you can train a computer to learn how to play checkers using actual code. You can code in, if it does this, we do this, and optimize it that way. Or you can just say, forget all of that. I'm going to take a bunch of pictures, give it to the computer, and it's going to figure out how to play. So not only do you no longer have to write out all this code, you can, just, you can even just sit down and play an actual game of checkers with a camera, and a computer will know how to play against you, which is taking out all of this stuff that we have to now implement and turn it into like, oh yeah, we just got images, so you just sit down and play and it, they'll figure it out for you, which is fantastic. But predicting beauty, so let's go more into that abstract kind of area. How would you go about predicting not a cat or a dog, something like beauty, which is kind of subjective? So we're gonna start with a definition, which is very exciting. So beauty is the property of being visually pleasing. Does everyone all understand what beauty is? Really? <laughs> so we might be able to understand from a, like a definition. If you give this definition to a computer, it, it, does, it means nothing to it. Instead, you have to give it examples as to what you want to do it, like you would a child. This is a dog, this is not. This is beautiful, this is not. So here, personally, is how I would label a data set. So I'd say, okay, these four pictures, I like these. I think these are very beautiful. That frog, is, I would prefer my model to not predict that as beautiful. Now this seems super duper straightforward, right? We just label a bunch of images, yeah? No. <laughs> so the problem is, everyone feels differently about images, right? So beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Does anyone here like this image? Do they think this frog is beautiful? Yeah. <laughs> so how can we have a model have a single source of truth as to what is beautiful, what is not, when we ourselves cannot really classify what it is? And there's a couple ways we can get around this. The first is an individual model. This is a model that's just based on me. It's just what I like and what I don't like, and it's completely it cannot be used abstractly in the population. It can be only used to predict things for me versus something like a census model where it has to predict for a whole group of people. So the model we're going to be doing today is actually consensus data because I didn't want to personally label a million images. <laughs> so instead, we're doing a data set. So we're going to do a consensus model. And then we can also change how it's predicted. So we can either predict, okay, this is a beautiful image, this is not. But again, this doesn't take into account all these different ideas about an image. I know there was a study about, like, quite a bit ago where it took images from like, um, dating web websites where people would rate how hot or not the person is. And what they found is the people who were rated most attractive were also kind of rated most least attractive, as in people viewed them most polarizing. Some people really liked it and some people really didn't. So you have to be able to capture information in your model, as in like, sure, I might really, really like an image, but you might really not, so we need to be able to account for that. So you can do that by instead predicting, say, a histogram of kind of how the ratings are going to go. So this one is mostly a six and a seven people teeter off, versus another one which might be like a bunch of ones and a bunch of tens and nothing in the middle. However, for ease, saying that, we're going to do be beautiful or ugly. <laughs> And now we can finally start making our beauty model. So I found this data set online. What it is is 10,000 images that were taken um, 
free use rather than use it for anything. And these were all labeled as between one and five aesthetically by five different people. These people were Amazon employees, I think it's Mechanical Turk, paid for their time, they labeled one through five. Does anybody have any red flags popping in their head <laughs> as to how useful this data set is? All right, so one, 10,000 images, maybe not useful. Um, can you imagine the concept of beauty being represented in 10,000 images? Yeah, probably not. Another, the biggest problem though, five people. Five people decided what's good and what's not, what's beautiful and what's not. Not exactly representative of all people. We also don't know anything about them, which comes into a problem with things like personality. So what they've actually found is that extroverts are more likely to rate things like intensely. They either really like it or they really don't, versus people who are more introverted tend to be more meandering in the middle, and you have to really impress them to get a five out of them. So not knowing anything about these people's personality, we don't really know how they're rating either. And it's just five people, so we can't say, oh, it's a big enough population, we can just forget about it. So that's an issue with this. So this one's might be a little hard to see, but this is actually the screen that they rated these images with. So on the top, you can rate one through five of low aesthetic to high aesthetic. But we also have little boxes we can check, which is negative things and positive things. So in our negative things, we have things like bad lighting. It's a dull color. Whereas positive things, we have vivid color. And there's the rule of thirds. More flags. <laughs> More flags should be going. Going back to bias. We have negative effects and positive effects. We've already told them what a good looking image should be and what a bad looking image should be. So if they're looking at this image and they're like, oh, I like it, but it's checking all these negative boxes. Maybe I shouldn't like it. Maybe I should rate it lower. Bad, bias. Also, we already have a subjective thing we're trying to rate, which is aesthetic. And we're adding more subjective things on it, which is, does it have a vivid color? What does that mean? <laughs> Would a vivid even mean to you. So more issues. But I use this data set because good training data is very rare and very expensive. Um, today about how data is exploding. We have so, so much data and so much of it is just baloney. It's just not useful. You have to put so much work in to make it useful. And doing that is incredibly expensive, therefore rare, therefore really to have access to if you're just going online and looking up random data sets. <laughs> so we used this data set because we had to, pretty much. So we're going to make some adjustments. We're going to forget about negative effects, positive effects, not included in the model. We're just going to do this one through five aesthetic rating, keeping in mind it's going to be a little biased. And we're also going to pare down our data set. So right now our data set looks kind of like this. We're like, this image down here, which is bad, uh, up on top is a five, which is good. But again, going back to the, oh, some people rate four, some people rate five. So we can't predict a four for an image if that other person might rate a five if they just had a slightly different personality. So we're gonna bucket them. We're gonna say four and five, beautiful. One is ugly, forget about three. We don't care about three. <laughs> three is too boring. And then we have to list all of our options. So again, we can, just, we can continue on. We can make this model, we can do it. But we have to be sure as to what exactly it is we are making. So we have to assume, okay, this is gonna attempt to predict placebo of beauty, but it's gonna predict the level of beauty that five people felt. So if you want a model based on what five people think about you, you can make this model. And then we're just gonna list out the rest of our assumptions we've gone through, and then we can implement it. So this is the part that I've kind of made some adjustments to in the past couple of months because things have been going forward so fast, uh, particularly in regards to the level of knowledge you even need to know about a model in order to make one. So something like Cloud, cloud Auto ML, this is automated machine learning. All you really need is a data set, plug it in. It'll tune itself, it'll test itself, it'll give you the best possible option. Incredibly new, incredibly fantastic. If you're not interested in the whole process of constructing your own CNN, but if you want to, you can. You can go to Python and you can implement it. 
Um, I've overwritten my hard drive <laughs> once or twice doing this. Um, it's risky. <laughs> And then you have the happy medium, which is something like transfer learning, which is like this model has already been set up and tuned. We're just going to take most of that and just add a little bit at the end to kind of fix it to our particular data set. So I'm actually not going to walk through a code example for this, because when you're doing transfer learning, again, it's plug and play. You just look at the tutorial. You can copy the code, plug in your data set, and go. Like, it's that easy. And something like Cloud AutoML, you don't even need to do that. You don't even need to touch the code at all. So I really wanted to focus on this training and this pulling out of the data, because everything else, five years out, you won't need to touch code to do a model. So why am I wasting your time <laughs> walking through a model that doesn't freaking work? It's not even useful. Like, what the heck? A couple of reasons. Um, one is that I feel in the news and everything like that, you hear about so many awesome models that they're predicting all these things and they're in production and they're just crazy. But you don't realize those models are not that. So much has to go into making that great model. So much just annoyance and doing all this work and then it turns out awful. Um, not only because your data set is dirty, you could have the cleanest data set in the world and there might just be nothing in it. Like it might just be useless. You just have to be mentally prepared for that. This is a normal process. Also, to kind of, another reason I wanted to walk through it is to show how s much you have to scrutinize this data that goes in. You can't just like look up a data set, be like, cool, this looks nice, let's go, let's make a model. You have to look, you have to read the PDF. <laughs> you have to read everything about this data set in order to do anything with it. <sighs> to garbage in, garbage out. I keep emphasizing that. <laughs> okay, so. There actually have been models that have been created that are, work very well aesthetically. Um, something like Google's, I don't know if you just say NIMA, but it's N-I-M-A. Um, it's based on hundreds of images rated by hundreds of people, and it can predict the level of photographic aesthetic quality in an image to the point where they can provide recommendations as you are shooting photos as to how to best adjust your camera to get the best image. Like, these things are in production, you just need a good training set in order to get there, sadly. But why else should we bother? This is what 2015 Yelp looked like. I don't know if any of you remembered it. <laughs> it was not a pretty sight. So they used to have images on top. And these images would be based on how many clicks an image got. So the more times you click on an image, the faster it would go to the top of this rotating thing of images of the restaurant. An issue is, once an image got to the top, it stayed at the top because you click on the top images, so it kept reinforcing itself. Another problem is people would see blurry, awful images, so they click on them because they wanted to see a bigger, more large version and see what's going on. So these blurry, awful images are getting pushed to the top. Just a bad, bad cycle. So Yelp actually implemented an aesthetic model before it was cool. So this is what 2016 Yelp looked like. This is the exact same restaurant. And what they do is they pulled in all these images. They had individual people rating them. They went through this expensive process. And in the end, they had a fantastic model that now you actually want to eat at these restaurants. <laughs> but coming into the future, potential applications are insane. Again, this is all super new stuff, so it's not really in production yet. But things like being able to predict what the most scenic route home is for you based on just images of the surrounding area on the road. So if you're like, oh, on Google Maps, oh, I don't really care about getting there that fast. I want to see some cool stuff. It will know what you think is cool, and it'll be able to predict that for you and send you there. Not only that, but UI, oh my gosh. <laughs> so background, I worked at an advertising agency before this, and the idea of being able to already know what image will most likely grab your attention before we even put it out in production or do testing, A-B testing, fantastic. Hundreds of millions of dollars saved. Very, very useful. But some like general CNN uses too? Crazy amounts of things. Going through the airport, everyone does it. There's somebody sitting there looking at your bag, reading it, sitting there for hours. Modeling can solve that, and it's in the process of doing that. That's why when we walk through the scanner and it gives you a yes or no, that's just a, a CNN looking at every piece of you, seeing if it can detect a weird looking object. So this is the next step for airports. Um, doctors are already implementing things like taking x-rays, feeding it through a model, 
outputs whether you have certain nodes in your lungs that they need to have checked out. The next steps are things like blood samples. Give a blood sample, you don't need to sit and send it away for testing. It just takes it, scans it, and it's like, is there anything weird in here? Yes, no, you know the same day. Or things like, I didn't want to put a picture of a skin rash up here because I thought that'd be really weird. But like skin rashes, you can take a picture of what it is and it'll output what you have and what medicine you need in order to fix it. But general modeling uses are absolutely insane what we can do but haven't yet. So things like optimal recipes. We have allrecipes.com. It has so many recipes in it. They've all been rated. You could take all that information and automatically create what the best recipe is for something. Insane. Oh, this one is really cool. So this is December of 2018. The first piece of AI art was auctioned off at an art house. It sold for over $400,000. No artist touched this. It was just an output from a machine. Insane. <laughs> but yeah, and it comes into the question of, are machines artists now? Is art even a human pursuit? Or is it just, is creativity just whatever? And a machine can be creative if it wanted to. And if so, what's the purpose of us making art even if a computer can do it better and faster? Nuts, just crazy stuff. And finally, this hyper-tuning stuff. Um, like I said before, going into the future, I'm guessing five years, we won't be tuning anything. Um, it will be abstracted away from us. Because really, tuning is like a series of steps you go through in order to try to figure out which the best model is and stuff. And if there's a, a bunch of steps that you can follow in order to get an optimal model, that can be automated. It's steps. A machine can do steps way better than we can. So going towards that, we're going to eventually get to the point where all that matters is the data going in is good. And past that, uh, the idea of abstracting that away. So we don't even need to about, need about, worry about training our data anymore or looking into it. A model will know what a clean data set looked like, and it can clean it for you, and it can find it for you. And we're not even modeling at all. It's just making models all of a sudden. <laughs> just, it just amazes me how fast this is all going. But yeah. Um, Key takeaways, because that was a lot all at one time. <laughs> garbage in, garbage out, and I can't put this in here enough. <laughs> if you're making your own models, that data set going in is the most important part. I can't tell you how many projects I've been on with incredibly smart people with PhDs in mathematics, and they know so much about modeling and particular models, and they can create a CNN layer by layer, and it's really great, and it performs really well until you take it into production, and it sees other data and it just falls apart because the data set going in wasn't representative of what actually is supposed to be going in. It happens all the time. I mean, Eva went over a couple examples of how this can happen badly. So really focus on this. And the second is that anyone can make a model, especially coming up like maybe two, three years, like TensorFlow 2.0 just came out and that is also geared towards accessibility, which is like you don't need to worry about all this nitty gritty stuff. Just have good data, know what you want, and it'll do it for you. We're really getting there. And what's more, machine learning needs creativity. Right now it's a bunch of devs working in it, and we're not known as being the most creative people in the world. Um, <laughs> less, maybe less models that predict sales output and more creative models like we walked through that predict things like how awesome something is, or just absurd things about your day. Like, you can model things about your day. It's just, it needs creativity, and the more people who are into it, and the more accessible it is, the better it can be creative. But yeah, I talked a little fast, so it's over a little early. But you can find me at Ferguson Ray Everything. And then also, if you want the deck, I have resources here. In particular, TensorFlow transfer learning, um, if you want to start up with modeling really fast, again, it's pretty much copy-paste. You can input your own data and it'll output, and you can work your way through like, making changes. Andrew, I don't know how to pronounce his name, his last name, <laughs> but he is fantastic if you want to know the nitty-gritty of why modeling is important and all the different steps of it. Chris Ola's blog, I love Chris Ola. He, um, he's a Google employee, but he's always at the forefront of everything, and he's very particular on pulling out um, why a modeling is doing what it's doing. 
And then also I have a link here for freely available data sources. Um, it's literally just reddit.com slash datasets. <laughs> it's just hundreds and hundreds of freely available. You can talk to everyone about it, talk through all the biases, everything like that. But yeah, that would be about it for me. Are there any...